Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Hamjambo. I want to hear it like Hamjambo. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very, very warm greeting to each and every one of you. Welcome in, in International Colloquium about Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, a politician with a soul, a servant of God. This colloquium explores the link between faith and political career of Mwalimu, the first president of Tanzania. As an example of new politics advocated by Pope Francis. My name is Ange Rosin from Rwanda. Um, the one you see here, I will let her introduce herself. To msifu Yesu Christo. Wote wanatoka Tanzania jameni. Karibuni sana. Mujisikia nyumbani. Eh, eh, stanno dicendo che benvenuti tanto, tanto, tanto siete a casa, perciò tu già mamogia. Mi chiamo in italiano, in swahili, in inglese. Ok, I'm Zipora Morin Cepkemoi, però per gli amici e familiari sono Morin. E vengo dal Kenya. E che mi hanno detto di parlare italiano. Okay. For friends and families, I'm Maureen. And uh, you are welcome. I'm from Kenya. Third year doctorate student in the social sciences here in the Gregorian. We are seeing visitors who are coming. Just to set, take your seats. We are having more seats this way. Come this way, please. Karibuni. Feel at home. There are still seats this side. Karibuni. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, before we dive into this afternoon agenda, uh, I would like to give you some information uh, about utilities you may need. Uh, for ladies' washroom, you find it right far in the corner as you exit in this room. Gentlemen, man, you find it uh, the, the parallel side of ladies. In case you are craving for coffee, we have great cafe. We have everything, coffee, cappuccino. Uh, you will find there what you need. So without further ado, let us start with opening prayer. I would like to invite Maureen for praying for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for all the gifts and blessings you have bestowed upon us. As we gather here today for this special forum on the life and legacy of Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and reverence. We humbly rec recognize your presence among us as we seek your guidance and blessings for the proceedings that are about to, to take place. We extend our deepest thanks to the pontifical and non-pontifical universities represented here, institutions dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. We are grateful for the scholarly contributions and diverse perspectives they bring to enrich this forum. Lord, we also uplift in prayer every individual present in this auditorium, each one uniquely created by you. 
bless the distinguished guests, educators, students, and all participants from various walks of life. May this gathering be a place of enlightenment, fostering a spirit of unity and shared purpose. We thank you for the opportunity to delve into the life of Moli Munyerere, a statesman and a servant of God. May the insights shared today inspire us towards justice, compassion, and the pursuit for a better world. Dear Lord, as we embark on this journey of learning and reflection, grant us open hearts and minds to understand the lessons that Mwalimu Julius Nyerere's life teaches us. May we be inspired to emulate his commitment to justice, peace, and service to humanity. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Mwalimu Julius Kambarange Nyerere. Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Maureen. The prayer was, was touching. Um, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, who are going to give us welcoming remarks and opening remarks to, to come on the podium to take a seat. Um, Father Lewis Marx, Peter Lau, and then we join our hands in, in time we are inviting them. <laughs> Father Anthony, Anthony Ekpo. Monsignor uh, Fortunatus, welcome. And also, I would like to invite his Excellence Muhammad Tabit Kombo, Ambassador of Tanzania. Okay, it's okay. He's coming a little bit late. We'll be waiting for him. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I would like to invite Father Mark Lewis, Director of Pontifical Gregorian University, to give us welcoming remarks and greeting. Father, you are welcome. Your Excellency, Archbishop Fortunatus, Monsignor Anthony Ekpo, the ambassador who didn't make it, I guess. I say, Shikamuni. To all of the to all of the professors, students, guests, and friends, Assalamu Alaikum. Pace. Matthew 23, 8 instructs us, quote, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And yet we use this term, professor, docente, and yes, molimo, as a respect for those who instruct us, not only in human things, but also in the divine. It seems important enough for us to ignore what scrip scripture asks of us by recognizing the teaching of God and the humans who are dear to us. So we open this celebration of the servant of God, Julius Nyerere, a teacher, a model for others, and a soulful politician as today's cloak colloquium wishes to discuss. What makes this topic so important for us today? Alas, one only needs to follow the news to know that there is not great respect for teachers or politicians in our age. We seem to have lost that sense of respect because we lack those teachers and those politicians who, like Julius Nyerere, earn the respect of others through a disinterested service to others. We must have teachers and politicians who take care of their students 
and their people first, making decisions that do not seem, simply bring wealth, but allow for service, growth, and happiness. It is not surprising that Pope Francis says that we need these kinds of politicians today. Politicians with soul, with values, with a sense of responsibility to those whom they serve. One of my desires for our Gregorian University is that we have sufficient time and place to reflect on what our responsibilities are given, the gifts, the talents that we have received from our God. I think that this colloquium provides us with that opportunity for reflection, for forming our own plan for acting justly. Julius Nyerere once said that, quote, our children may learn about heroes of the past. Our task is to make ourselves architects of the future. It is important for us to study, to reflect, and to learn from the heroes of our past something that has also disappeared somewhat in our own day of constant criticism and critique, but always with the idea of evaluating about how we might become architects of our own future, a future that is more just, more peaceful, and more prosperous for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Mark, for your opening remarks. And congratulations. It seems you were born in Tanzania, eh? <laughs> Actually, I, I guess he has given a very perfect talk and thought of Molimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. What do you think? What Tanzania? Mufanya hivi kama nisawa. Ah, OK. So they are saying that it is OK. So let me welcome Monsignor Anthony Onyemuche Ekpo, Under Secretary of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development from the Holy See. Welcome. Let us welcome him with a clap. Eh? Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Your Grace, um, Archbishop uh, Fortunatus Mwachuku, um, the uh, Rector Magnificus, Father Mark Lewis, Your Excellencies, and um, students and uh, people of Tanzania and from Africa, on behalf of the, uh, the prefect of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, Cardinal Michael Cherney, I offer all of you uh, warm greetings and cordial good wishes to, uh, to all of you here present and those following online. Um, our Dicastery is involved or, or treats issues of uh, uh, human development, and that's why uh, we're here uh, today to uh, express our best wishes and also to uh, uh, talk to you a bit more about the, uh, what our dicastery does. Founded in 2016 by Pope Francis, the mission of the dicastery is to support the Holy Father and the bishops in promoting integral human development. This mission involves accompanying local churches in their pastoral ministries to overcome obstacles to integral human development. The ultimate goal of our dicastery is to give life and to ensure that no one is excluded. Through various social apostolates, such as migrant ministry and healthcare ministry, the local church in Tanzania works to identify obstacles to human development. The dicastery was privileged to collaborate with the uh, local church in Tanzania through uh, listening sessions to help the church identify those obstacles and to anticipate a way forward. And just uh, uh, last May, we had the bishops of Tanzania in our dicastery, where, and that offered us uh, a, a, um, a very uh, rich opportunity to talk about the issues of human development in Tanzania. The major aim of this conference, uh, or this colloquium is to mark the 10th anniversary of Evangelii Gaudium and the third anniversary of Fratelli Tutti. And these papal documents invite us to reflect on the connection between faith and social commitment. By invoking the legacy of Julius Nyerere, this uh, colloquium recognizes in him a fitting example uh, for our reflection. So we couldn't have chosen any better uh, figure, African figure, to reflect on. In the life of Julius Nyerere, we see a shining uh, confluence 
between faith and social commitment, at least in a couple of ways. Firstly, his life was characterized by simplicity and service to others, even sacrificing personal comforts to the benefit of others. Secondly, he diligently worked for the unification of his people. Tanzania has over 120 tribes, and the adoption of Kiswahili as the national language helped to unite the people and to break down barriers that were found, founded, that, that were found uh, between them. His uh, project of unification was informed by the philosophy of Ujamaa, which is family beyond blood relations. Why not a perfect philosophy, even today open to evaluation and criticism, Ujamaa was the catalyst for uh, some significant social changes, such as bringing uh, uh, electricity to communities and the expansion of road uh, networks, the building of schools, and the growth of small towns. Why initiating these changes, Nyerere ensured that these projects kept in central focus the individuals affected by them. The betterment of people and of the human person was the motivation for his social reforms. For its uh, part, the church recognizes his life and example as one of holiness and admiration. Julius Nyerere has been named a servant of God since 2005 and is on the path to beatification. As Africa continues to struggle to overcome many obstacles to uh, integral human development, it is my hope that the fraternal dialogue that we take place in this hall today and in this context of the colloquium, we bear much fruit, not only for Africa, but also for the entire uh, human family. Thank you. Having Baba Wataifa as a servant of God is not something to be clapped just like this. I want to hear the, 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 that way of, I mean, proclaiming the joy of, in Africa, eh? It's like, because I see here we are, I mean, 99, almost 0.9% African. So I just want to hear a clap of thank God that Baba Wataifa is a servant of God. Can I? Wow, that was perfect. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right now, let me welcome Archbishop Fortunatus to give us a word. Welcome him with a clap of hands, please. <laughs> Karibu. I thank the organizers of this session for inviting us. I say us because the primary invitation was addressed to the Undersecretary of our Dicastery, Monsignor Samuel Sangali, who is today in China on official visit representing the Holy See while he was leaving for China, the pro-prefect of our dicastery was coming back from Tanzania. He returned this morning because he went to install the new Archbishop of Tabora, who is also my predecessor in the dicastery as the secretary of the dicastery, His Eminence, Cardinal Protas Rugambwa. In his speech in Tanzania, Cardinal Tagle, who is the pro-prefect, reminded the people of the synodal way that the Pope is proposing for us, for the church, is in a way that is based on communion, on mission, and on participation. And these are elements that are very important 
for a good governance. As we talk about Mwalima Julius Nyerere, I want to tell you that this man is a challenge in today's Africa. Today we have a crisis of leadership in our continent. I'm sure you're not going to doubt it. Quite often, we try to either wish away or divert attention from our problems by maybe justifiably also calling the foreigners who might have caused our problems. We invoke slave trade and the slavery. We invoke colonialism as things that have kept us where we are. Maybe they have. But let us, let us just do a little introspection, which I'm sure is what um, Julius Nyerere did. There is hardly any country in the world, any people, that have not had some experience of slavery. Any people that have not had some experience of colonialism. If you think of the time we talked of the reign of the two Napolis, even this country, Italy, has had its own experience of colonialism. You go to the various countries in Europe, you think of even the great Israel as we think of today. You only need to open the pages of the Bible. They have experienced all sorts. But they did not dwell in licking their wounds and blaming others. They tried to come home and do introspection and say, we don't want to make the mistakes others have made us to make or others have made in us. You know what we have today? In Africa, we criticize colonialism, but what we have? We have an enculturation of colonialism. We bring colonialism home. Some people call it ethnocentrism. Others call it tribalism. Tell me, we go to some places and we are worried about the people that propagate white supremacy concepts. And we come back to Africa, we have ethnic supremacy, tribal supremacy. One tribe is feeling it is superior to the others, maybe because it is lucky to have more people that have got titles. Is that not what we have gotten from the others? Or one tribe gets the power, and then it uses the power to oppress another tribe or other tribes. Is that not colonialism? Why do we bring it home? Why then do we keep to blame, blame others? Now, where does Mualim Julius Nyerere stand out? We look around Africa. There is hardly any country in the, con in the continent that doesn't have acute problems of ethnocentric prejudice, ethnocentric discrimination. I can tell you this because I am the secretary of the Dicastery for Evangelization, precisely the section that deals with first evangelization and the new young local churches. Our Dicastery is the extended arm of the Pope in ex uh, dealing with relationship with the local churches in making provision for the churches, helping the Pope advising him on who becomes bishop and where. And I can tell you, we have problems in the naming of bishops in most of our African countries. Oh, he is not from our tribe, he is not going to be accepted. 
Oh, he is not from that type, that area. He's not going to be accepted. Instead of accepting him, we prefer the priests from Europe. We prefer Europeans to our own brothers who are from other ethnic groups. Is that not racism uh, inculturated? Now, Mualima, Mualimu Julius Nyerere, was able to focus on uniting his people. That is one place when we are pro making the provision for a bishop, the least worry for us is which is his ethnic group, where is he coming from, which is his tribe. And that is because of Julius Nyerere. As a president, his focus was not on how big, how fat his bank account is somewhere in Europe. His emphasis was not on how many big or his fleet of cars. No. His focus was on Ujama. How can we be together, brothers and sisters? In this, he already had the foresight, living out already what Pope, Pope Francis would write in the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, taking the example from Francis of Assisi, who sees in everybody a brother and a sister. And in his life also, Julius Nyerere put into practice the thing that St. Paul gives us. We remember his letter to the Ephesians. If you open your Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 13 to verse 20. In verse 13, he tells us that those who were far off have now become near. With the blood of Christ, that broke down the walls, dividing walls, making us one people. And then in verse 19, precisely it says, you are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens in the same household, the family, that has got the apostles as its foundation with Jesus Christ as a cornerstone. Mualimu Julius Nyerere lived according to the spirit of the word of God in the New Testament and according to the spirit that we find in that beautiful encyclical of Pope Francis, Fratelli Tutti, on social international fraternity. May all our other African presidents and leaders today take the leaf from him and not focus on their own personal enrichment, material enrichment, not focus on favoritism towards their own ethnic groups, but on the universal fraternity, brotherhood, and sisterhood that should characterize people that profess the church as family of God. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. It is true that we have crisis of leadership in Africa. And then, let us learn from Julia Nyerere. Thank you so much. Let us appreciate, um, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, now, I would like to invite His Excellency um, Hamoud Tab uh, Tabit Kombo, Ambassador of Tanzania, to deliver our opening remark. Thank you. Excellencies at the high table, dear participants, my brothers and sisters, buongiorno tutti. 
I'm learning Italian, so I've learned for three months, and I must admit I'm good now. Io parlo poco poco. I would like to extend, on behalf of the United Republic of Tanzania, our sincere greetings from our president, Madam Samia Sulu Hassan, who is fully aware that I am here today because I had to report and inform accordingly about this event and the importance of this event to all of us. So I would like to thank the organizers, Fratelli Tutti, and uh, all the participants for honoring a great man that among all his uh, praises, you forgot to mention one, which is our father of the nation. He is also my father of the nation, of my nation, which is my main identity. And all Tanzanians in this room, ni baba yetu wa taifa. So he's our father of the nation, and he earned that title. Call it politically, call it government, but he earned that title, and that title is there to stay forever. So greetings from the president, our president, Madam Samia Sulu, but also from the family who wanted to join with us, family of late Mwalim Nyerere. The son was uh, already nominated by the family, Dr. Makongoro Nyerere, to join with us today, but unfortunately, due to some unavoidable circumstances, he couldn't make it, but he was supposed to be with here us uh, today. So I will start with these greetings so that you accept them, and uh, on behalf of the United Republic of Tanzania, we fully support the symposium or colloquium that you have decided to pick this great man, not to us Tanzanians, not to East Africans, not to SADC, not to Africa, but globally, because we can see different nationalities who are here today, and some of them appointed as uh, origins of Tanzania from what you have presented. So thank you very much. Secondly, when I received this invitation, I shared with my other 49 colleagues who are ambassadors of the United Republic of Tanzania around the world. Uh, we are 50, all of us together. And I shared with uh, them immediately the poster plus uh, this image in our group, these days the so-called WhatsApp chat group. <laughs> we have ambassadors chat group. <laughs> and uh, we discuss many, many things. The things that you discuss in church, the things that are going on globally, and everyone presents their discussion, including our ambassador who is based in uh, Jerusalem. We have an embassy in Jerusalem. This season, he writes the most than most of us. So we read. And as diplomats, we are regulated in what we say and what we speak. But one key ambassador wrote to me privately. They call it these days inbox. <laughs> they wrote to me privately and said, how come it's only two, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, a politician with soul, and Mwalimu Nyerere, a servant of God. Mwalimu Nyerere is more to us. I will read extras that he wrote to leave it to you all as a challenge when you discuss about Mwalimu Nyerere if you feel comfortable and if you will agree with my colleagues you can add on top of that. And I'll mention a few because the list was very long. Besides politician with soul and a servant of God, my colleagues said he was a liberator because he liberated us. Not only United Republic of Tanzania, there are many countries who are also present in this room which I will not mention because they will speak for themselves. 
But once Mwalimu said, we Tanzanians are not going to be free if others in the neighborhood are not free. Hatutokuwa huru ikiwa jirani zetu na wenzetu hawakupata uhuru. And one good friend of, uh, of Kenya, my good friend, Kenya, I have a lot of good friends, Kenya. We call them Watani sometimes. Says you, Tanzania, don't speak uh, good uh, English as we do, Kenyans. And I said, also, you don't speak good Swahili as we speak. <laughs> and uh, number two, I said, you said English, but you are Kenyan. I said Swahili because I am Mswahili. So I had a, a privilege over, over the other language. So besides Mwalimu being a liberator, he liberated us also from all that tribalistic and ethnicity that we had in the country and united us with one language. Today, this language has won an international uh, status and uh, almost all of us, including my brother, counselor from uh, Burundi, he speaks Swahili. Uh, he speaks Swahili, good Swahili, <laughs> Sanifu. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we are trying also to unite our region, like many other regions, with our language. So besides Liberator Mwalimu, was an ambassador of Swahili in the region. Pan-Africanist, true African, independence seeker, because he is the one who negotiated independence for our country. I don't know, I was a bit late. I don't know if you mentioned the Malimu period where he was a prime minister before becoming a president. There was a short period that Mwalimu Nyerere was a prime minister. I hope you are going to discuss about that because that was a very important period of uh, Tanganyika, free Tanganyika, before Mwalimu became a president. And then Mze Rashid Mfaume Kawawa became the prime minister. So I hope, as a keynote uh, opening remarks, I like also to leave some challenges for discussion. Besides the father of the nation, our international figure and a governor who governed positively. Because a politician, not all politicians have governed. I know several politicians who are in opposition, they've never been part of government. Since our country was born, wale walokuwa katika vyama vya opinzani wengine hawakushika serikali, sindiyo? Na mpaka wataishia wengine sirahisi. Kwa sabu sifa ya mwanasiasa, the, the politician and governance is, a, you can defy a bit. So besides being a servant of God, he governed with good faith of, uh, and directions of God. So we are here to celebrate Mwalimu Nyerere. And I'm here to join you and uh, please rest assured our embassy is there to support you fully in uh, such occasions of honoring and remembering this great leader of Africa. For us, for our government of the United Republic of Tanzania, for our president, Madam Samia Sulu Hassan, we have decided that all embassies of the United Republic of Tanzania will have also cultural centers which will be propagate, propagating our Swahili culture and language. And uh, I'm very proud to say in Roma, which is my station, we have opened an official Swahili class that in honoring Mwalimu Nyerere, because he united the country. <laughs> he united the country with a common language. Today, excellencies, we don't ask a person, where are you from? What is your tribe? What is your ethnicity? Kabila la konani. We don't ask them, dini ya konani. What is your religion? What is your madhehebu, sect? 
or where you are originating from. No. We are identified as Tanzanians. We are identified as East Africans. We are identified as Africans because of Mwalimu Nyerere. This class that we have started, we are providing the Swahili service, like others who had uh, provided Swahili service before us. And uh, the two lecturers from this class are here today. And I would like you to see them for those with good reading. I don't know, how about your Swahili is good? No. No. <laughs> so you better join the class. <laughs> Naomba walimu wetu wa Kiswahili wasimame pale obalozini. Bwana Bwana Leons na bi Anastasia. These are our two Swahili uh, uh, teachers or professors, I can call them, because they were verified by the official body of Swahili. In, you call it Swahili in English, but it is Kiswahili. Bakita, Baraza la Kiswahili, Tanzania. So with these few words said, I would like once again to thank you very much for involving our embassy. We feel very proud to be associated with Mwali Munyerere always because without him, we wouldn't have been here. One of the other ambassadors said, if he had those things that you mentioned, stealing money, taking money, stealing money, etc., we today wouldn't have been standing here. It would have been a different altogether. We are standing here with suit and tie, nice ties, because of what uh, <laughs> they did. They didn't scrap off anything. We must give them their praise. They tried to save as much as possible and leave us a lesson that we should also live for others who will come after us, our children, our grandchildren, and our future generation. So I'm not alone. I'm here with our embassy staff who have accompanied me, and they are here. I would like them to stand with their families. Naomba msimame. Wale wote mnotokea obalozi wa jamhuri ya mungano wa Tanzania. Na wenza wenu naomba msimame ili muonekane. Hawafahamu kiswa ili vizuri, eh? So I'm not alone. You can see, I'm not alone. Asante ni sana na washukuru wakuja. Now I'll speak Swahili also to honor this great man. Besides as a servant of God and a, and a politician, also a propagator of a Swahili language as our national identity and national unifying factor. Naomba ndugu zangu wote mnaongea Kiswahili. Nichukue fursa hii kuwapongeza sana kwa jambo hili. Naomba sana tuchukue kauli ya wole soyinka. Wole soyinka, this I'll have to say in English because others have to listen as well and uh, understand me. Wole soyinka said, if we don't tell our own stories, if we don't tell our own success, who are you depending on to tell your, your story? And who are you depending on to tell your success? Kama hatuja yaelezea hadithi yetu wenyewe, unamtarajia nani aje kukuwelezea hadithi yako wewe? Kwa sabu na yana hadithi yaki. Na yepi atataka kusema ya kwaki. Kama sifa zenu hamja zitagazia nyinyi wenyewe, mnatarajia nani aje kukwambene sifa zenu? Mwalimu Nyerere is the son of Tanzania. Mwalimu Nyerere is not only the son of Butiama, but is the son of whole East Africa. Mwalimu Nyerere is the son of Africa, and Mwalimu Nyerere is the son of this world. We all together should cherish what you have. This is a wealth that we have, and we have to look for the future for such exemplary leaders that we, the current generation and the future generation should follow. These are all that I have in my open remarks. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me here and I feel very honored and privileged to be with all of you. And for those servants of God, please, when you say your prayers, do remember us as well. Thank you.
mwanzoni nilisema natoka Kenya. Baada ya kusikiza balozi siongei tena. Siongei tena eh. Basi, asante. Asante. <laughs> Nashukuru. Um, thank you very much to the Tanzanian ambassador and uh, right now I want to welcome his our um, Okay. So help me welcome the dean of the social science faculty here in the Gregorian University. If we are here, this event was organized under the social science faculty here in the Gregorian. So help me welcome Father Peter La, who is the dean to the faculty of social sciences. Welcome, Father. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Buonasera a tutti. Uh, ecco, parlo alla fine tocca a me per dire due parole. Vorrei in primo luogo ringraziare a quelli che avete organizzato. Uh, padre Albert Alejo, il gruppo degli studenti e tanti altri che avete fatto possibile, che avete collaborato a questo evento. I'm very pleased that, that this short conference is taking place first and that it is taking place here with us. As you know, the, social, the, social, the Faculty of Social Sciences has its foundation in the doctrine of the church and the social doctrine, social teaching of the church, which the Pope very nicely expressed with two words attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Laudato si, we give praise to God, and fratelli tutti, we are all brothers and sisters. We've heard about that. Uh, I don't want to, to dwell upon it. Uh, I welcome students who are here, and I invite everyone to study these encyclicals, to study the work of people who and the life of people like Julius Nerere who were putting them in practice before we maybe even were found words for it. Because this is our calling, this is our mission, particularly in the social context, in the political context, to, to take care of our common home and to live as members of the same household as brothers and sisters. I hope that this will lead as a dean, I have to say that. So I hope that this conference will inspire the students and the professors to, to deepen their knowledge. I hope and I would welcome it very much if this conference leads to, uh, to written reflections which we can share with people who are not participating here. Uh, and I definitely hope that this is not the first and last event or initiative of this, uh, of this kind. Uh, we in our Faculty of Social Sciences have a rich tradition with engagement in engagement with Africa. It goes back at least as far as I remember to the CHICS, to the Centro Interdisciplinare sulla Comunicazione Sociale, they had a, a, a good number of African students who are working in the media nowadays in Africa. Uh, we have a lot of students now here, and I hope that this connection continues and it becomes uh, a two-way street. Not just students coming here to learn things, but also students bringing with them the, the wealth of their experience, uh, and so we can become all richer by sharing and by studying this. So welcome everyone and I wish you a good, a good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Pitala. Uh, I would like to ask if it's possible. Actually, I was thinking we are not going to be many like this but surprisingly, look at how we are, which means 
this event is interesting. We want more, more and more. Yes? We will work on that. No. <laughs> There's two of us who want to make it happen. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, now we are going to, to watch a video of uh, Malimu Julius Nyerere of um, just may maybe some of you, you don't, didn't see him talking. This is time to, to listen like, how he was and what he was saying. Um, I would like to ask technician to play the video. Yes, thank you. What kind of business is that? If I do business with Abu Mayanja there, huh? he determines, he buys from me cotton, huh? and I buy from him whatever it is, chicken, or what? Sisal. Sisal. But he determines the price of the sisal which he sells to me. So he fixes that price of the sisal which he sells to me. But he also fixes the price of the cotton which he buys from me. Yeah. Well, un unless he's a god or an angel, an angel, hmm? I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble because he will raise the price of the sisal he sells and keep down the price of the cotton he buys from me. Inevitable. <laughs> he must do that. And this is what is happening all, not this imaginary thing. Abu has no sisal to sell to me and I have, I have no cotton to sell to him. But this is what is happening on, this, on the global basis. It is an unfair system, that system. So that system, the way it is organized, the way it is organized, by the North, run by the North, for the North. The way it is organized, that system always takes money, takes money from the South to the North. Transfers, transfers, we say, they say, it transfers resources, transfers wealth from the South to the North. I'll give you a small example. Tanzania, last, two years ago, we began pushing up the price of, pushing up the production of cotton again. So 1986-87, no, 85-87, 85-86, we doubled, we doubled our production of cotton. And, and we thought, uh, you know, because, because one of our problems is, 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 the, is the foreign exchange, and cotton is a big foreign exchange earner for Tanzania. So we doubled the, price, the, the cotton, the cotton production. And we thought, ah. And I tell you, I listen to the prices every morning. And one morning, it was, the price was 68 American cents to the pound. 68 American cents to the pound of cotton. I thought, fine, you know, if it can go on like that. The next morning, the next morning, it is 34, exactly half. 34 American cents to the pound. But it is not so. We would get less money. Why? Because we have spent a lot more foreign exchange to double the production. In order to double that production, we have used more fertilizer from the north. More insecticide from the north. We have to move it, to move it on trucks. So we have more trucks to move it from the north. So we have spent more money in order to produce that amount of cotton. But we get exactly the same amount as we got last year on half the crop. There is somebody in the north who had robbed of my country. Half. 
half of its cotton production was stolen by somebody in the north. That's, that is the system. That is the system. And if that system is not changed, if God Almighty, if God Almighty handed over that system to some angels to run it without changing it, it a vile vile. So you have to change that system. The system is wrong. It is a system organized for robbery. And robbery by the rich robbing the poor. And it is, it is totally wrong. And it is known it is wrong. Because it is, it, 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 it is as simple as that. You can explain it to any intelligent person in the north and he knows this system is wrong. A system that transfers wealth from poor people to the rich people automatically is wrong. It must be changed. We can't live with a system like that. What kind of business is that? If I do business with Abu Mayanja there, Thank you so much. Let, let's uh, uh, join our hand to appreciate Mwalimo. <laughs> he was an honest man. If you, if you, how you saw, the speech was coming from heart. Uh, now, I would like to invite um, Temple Anuforo. He is a Jesuit priest. And also, he is a student in um, sociology here in, at Gregorian University, uh, Faculty Social Sciences, to introduce our speakers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rosin. Uh, pardon me, I'm not going to speak as eloquently and as prophetically as Nyerere has just done. So please <laughs> make sure your expectations are very low. Um, your Excellencies, uh, Eminences, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends, once more, good evening to you all, and Karibu Sana. I will start the classes. <laughs> so, as she has mentioned, my name is Temple Anuforo. I'm a student here at the Gregorian, and my task this evening is very simple, and it's that of presenting three of our keynote speakers for this event. There's no particular order. I will present them in the manner, in the order in which their presentations will be made. So our first speaker for the evening is Dr. Mwanza Kamata. Did I get it right? <laughs> Dr. Mwanza Kamata. Dr. Kamata is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Dar es Salaam, born in Biryadi in Tanzania, Dr. Kamata received his PhD in political science from the University of Dar es Salaam. He is extensively published in the area of African politics and development. And he is one of the three lead authors of this biography of Julius Nyerere. It's a three volume biography. <laughs> and there are copies outside for those of us who might like to keep one. And it would be, not be wrong to say that, apart from Mwalimu himself, Dr. Kamata and this work um, has contributed in assembling us here today. Not only did these volumes inspire the initiatives that led to this colloquium, but it has been a guide in the process of planning for it. And I hear there is even another volume in the coming, and we can't wait to lay our hands on it and to, and to read it. So this evening, Dr. Kamata will be opening our colloquium presentation with a keynote titled, Julius Nyerere, a lifelong solidarity with the poor and the peoples of the South. Please, a round of applause for Dr. Kamata. Our second keynote speaker is Dr. 
Ethan Sanders. Dr. Sanders is an associate professor of history, politics, and political economy at Regis College, a Jesuit Catholic institution in Denver, Colorado, in the United States. He completed his doctoral work at the University of Cambridge, where he was drawn to the emerging subfield of global intellectual history with a geographic focus on Africa and the Indian Ocean world. Broadly speaking, he is interested in the political and religious history of Africa, and he has previously published on the Zanzibar Revolution and the Cold War, African political thinkers, missionaries and empire in Africa, Christian-Muslim relations in East Africa, and gender and ethnicity in Zanzibar. Dr. Sanders is currently working on two book-length projects. The first is titled, Building the African Nation, dot, dot, the African Association and Pan-Africanism in the 20th Century East Africa, under contract with Cambridge University Press, which looks at how early strands of Pan-African thought ignited the political imagination of East African intellectuals and political activists in the colonial and post-colonial periods. The second one is a religious and intellectual biography of Julius Nyerere. Beyond research, he sees his vocation as a scholar mentor and was attracted to Regis College because of the Ignatian principle of cura personalis, or care for the whole person, which most of us students here at the Gregorian understand. This evening, Dr. Sanders will be making a keynote presentation titled, Africa's Soulful Politician, dot, dot, Human Dignity and Equality in the Thought of Julius Nyerere. Dr. Sanders, you're very welcome. And our third speaker is someone many of us know, is Reverend Dr. Festo Nkender, SJ. Even though he forced us to put Father Nkender as Jesuits are wont to do. Dr. Festo Nkender, SJ, is a Jesuit priest from Tanzania who is currently serving as academic director of the Roman Archives of the Society of Jesus. A historian of Africa, Dr. Nkenda holds an MA from the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, and a DPhil from the University of Oxford. While Dr. Nkenda maintains scholarly interest in the areas of identity, nationalism, and unity in Africa, as well as contextualized theology and spirituality, and I'm sure the ambassador would like this, and the Kiswahili language. <laughs> in fact, he has a translation of the spiritual exercise into Kiswahili. Uh, most of Dr. Mkenda's research has focused extensively on Jesuit history in Africa. His most recent publications include, first, Jesuits in Africa, a historical narrative from Ignatius of Loyola to Pedro Arupe, which came out last year, and this year, a Splash of Diamond, the Jesuit presence in Ethiopia from 1945 to the present. This evening, Dr. Nkenda will be offering the third keynote on the title, Francis Nyerere and Politics as a Space for Human Encounter. So my brothers, my sisters, and my friends, please, may we put Together, a round of applause as we invite Dr. Kamata to come and deliver the first keynote. Good evening. Habari za jioni ndugu zangu. 
and I'm deliberately using ndugu zangu because to mwalimu binadamu wote ni sawa all human beings are equal according to mwalimu and he told us to believe that and to exercise that principle but there is a second related one where he says Binadamu wote ni ndugu zangu. All human beings. Literal translation will be, all human beings are my brothers and sisters. They are relatives. But he, there is a, a joint to that where he says, all human beings are my oh, brothers and sisters and Africa is one. So we grew up in Tanzania, uh, referring to each other as Ndugu. And Ndugu Balozi, uh, we, we didn't use Excellency Balozi. We would say, as today in Swahili, say Mweshimiwa Balozi. Uh, but uh, during Smarimu's era, it was Ndugu Balozi. We are all equal. He was, um, we are equals, but he is one among equals as a leader. So I have begun with that just to remind ourselves of what Mwalimu wanted to promote in the country. And it has been mentioned here that Mwalimu built a nation a nation of Tanzanians. So when I was invited, and I should not forget to thank uh, Fazal Albert and uh, Mkenda for searching for who should be invited to come to, from Tanzania to speak on Mwalimu. And I was lucky to be invited, and I think because I happened to be privileged to be part of the project of writing the biography of Mwalimu, uh, which has been introduced to you uh, shortly. But when I was asked what to talk, to choose what I was invited and I was told, just tell us what you want to, to talk about. And it took me some time, and then uh, I decided to talk about Mwalimu and his lifelong solidarity with the poor people of the house. But what inspired me is Mwalimu's speech, which he made in 1970, which my, some of you might have read it. And it was a speech to the Merrick Knoll sisters in 1970 in New York. And the title of the speech is Church in Society. And Mwalimu speaks and expresses his, his concern of how societies were and how the world was during that time. And his description was that the world was divided between the rich and the poor. Societies, especially in the poor countries, were also divided between the rich and the poor. And whoever selected that short creep of Mwalimu, I would say thank you because you have assisted me to say partly what I was or I had planned to say. So th that's what inspired me to, to, to think of Mwalimu and his solidarity with the poor peoples of the South. Basically, he talks about the peoples and the nations. And in this particular clip, he was talking about nations, poor nations. Wealth flows from the poor nations and goes to the rich nations. And that was a major concern. 
And I would quickly say that that has not changed. It was 1970, it is 2003, that has not changed. As the poor in societies, in Africa, for example, Mwalimu was concerned about the division between the rich and the poor. Wealth flows from the poor to the rich. And that creates inequality and injustice. So the source of all injustice in the world, according to Mwalimu, was that division and the system which allows that division to continue. So probably I should say a few things about Mwalimu before I proceed. Uh, Mwalimu was born in Butiama, and those who will be interested, I brought a few volume, uh, books for those who will be interested and the history of Mwalimu's childhood, education, etc., is all in the three volumes. Mwalimu was baptized in 1943. And one of the anecdotes in the book is that when Mwalimu was baptized, he didn't choose a name for himself. The name was given. And uh, so he was, the name given to him was Julius. And then he was very curious to know who is this Julius. He found out he was a saint, uh, but he was disappointed that, yes, he was a saint, but he was not one of the most famous saints. So maybe if he was given a chance to choose a name for himself, he would have chosen a name of a most famous saint. But now there is a whole process of Julius named after Saint Julius of becoming a saint himself. Um, Julius led his country in the struggle for independence. That was Tanganyika from 1961, no, from 1954, when they formed, officially, when they formed the, the Nationalist Party called Tanganyika African National Union, and Mwarim became uh, the president of that party. But it's also very important to mention here that Mwarim was a teacher, and he taught in two, two different Catholic schools. One is St. Mary's, Tabora, before, after he, 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 he graduated from Makerere. And then he went to Edinburgh. He came back to Tanzania, Tanganyika, and he taught at St. Francis College from 1953 to 1955. And I want to to say something about that. Um, he would have continued to be a teacher after 1955. He was in a Catholic college and it was a safe haven for a nationalist. But prior to that, the colonial government has issued a secular to all government employees that they have to choose their jobs or their involvement in politics, even becoming a member of a political party. So it started with those who were working in the government. But then they realized that was not enough because all these people, like Julius Kambarage Nyerere, who were involved in politics, they were working for non-governmental institutions and the church was one of them. But they found a reason, and the reason was churches were receiving subsidies from the government to pay salaries. So they wrote another secular instructing the churches that whoever was working with them but was involved in politics, 
he had to make a choice to continue working as a teacher or to resign as a teacher and work as a politician. So far, Zawil is called Mwalimu and informed of this choice. And Mwalimu chose to resign as a teacher and chose to continue with political work. This is always made as a reference on the sacrifice Mwalimu made because he was jobless. Immediately, he was jobless. He didn't have a house to go to. He had a family, he had a wife and two children. So Mwalimu, I think, chose to go back to Butiama and he stayed there for a long time. He had a choice of looking for a job and there are so many jobs available. He was educated, etc., but he chose not to. And in Butiama, there are stories about when he was working with the church, translating the catechism from English to Kizanaki, etc. So anyway, those are some. But he, this is a sacrifice he made, a choice he made at the early days of the struggle for independence to devote his time in the struggle for the independence of his country. And when he came back to Dar es Salaam, he lived on assistance from uh, his colleagues because the party had no enough money to pay him a salary. Okay, so that's uh, how things were, were happening. But then he, we fought for independence and independence came earlier than it was expected because if you read the book, when Mwalimu was asked, what do you, when do you expect independence of Tanganyika to come? Mwalimu would say maybe in 15 or 25 years. So if you take 1955 and you add up, it would have been 1975 or 1980 something. But independence came in 1961, seven years after the formation of the Tanganyika African Union. Now, to lead an independence or, uh, or movement in the context of colonialism, I would say it's not something unique. Okay, many were out of necessity, had to give themselves for the independence of their countries because colonialism was universally within the colonies, uh, not an acceptable system. And it was very easy, of course, with some difficulties, to organize the colonized against colonialism. So, Mwalimu, like Jomo Kenyatta, like Kamuzu Banda, like uh, Hofford Bonye, like many other leaders, he, he, he happened to be a leader of a liberation movement which led his country to independence. But what is unique is that what do you do with independence? Of course, the masses had their own aspirations. The elite, the nationalists who provided leadership also had their own uh, expectation after independence. And the immediate, for most, most of the, the African elite who led the independence, was to occupy the privileged positions left by the colonizers. So they became ministers, they became principal secretaries, they became heads of parastatal organization, etc. So privileged position, that's one. But two, they started using their position to accumulate wealth for themselves. So it started happening in Tanzania, but immediately after independence, Mwalimu was asking himself a question. What kind of Tanganyika, what kind of society is Tanganyika going to be? And what kind of leadership will be required to lead the Tanganyikans into that kind of society? In 1962, the ambassador mentioned uh, 1962, 1962 February, I think Mwalimu resigned as prime minister. Of course, they are, I won't go into that. He resigned, 
But one of the, how he spent his time, okay, he, he was mobilizing and reorganizing his party, but he was also translating Shakespeare's book, um, The Merchant of Venice, and the Merchant of Venice and Julius Caesari in Tuki Swahili. But he also had time to articulate his idea of Ujama. And he wrote a pamphlet which was published in 1962, uh, Ujama, the Basis of African Socialism. He had thought about Ujama before, but it was not articulated. So he produced that. Uh, but that was not the time when the, the Ujama was implemented in Tanzania until 1967. And Mwalimu had enough more, he, he had he, more time to, to refine his idea of the kind of society we wanted to build in Tanzania. And that come, came in 1965, seven, when Mwalimu pronounced the Arusha Declaration. So I'm saying this because Mwalimu was concerned with the kind of situation after independence and what was unfolding in the country. His colleagues were busy accumulating for themselves, forgetting that there were millions of Tanganyikans who needed attention, who needed their aspirations to be translated in an independent uh, country. And to him, the future society and I will, because I'm here, Mwarimu's uh, Jerusalem for Tanganyika. Mwarimu's Jerusalem for Tanganyika was the Ujama. A society where men and women are equal and are treated as human beings, where there will be no exploitation between man and man or a group of men exploiting others. So that was one of the issues which concerned Mwalimu. And I'm, so in that sense, I say he, it's a choice he made, and it was a reflection of his solidarity, a continuation of solidarity with the masses with whom he fought for independence of Tanganyika, but he was also articulating and identifying with the, their, their concerns. Um, that's one aspect, but the second aspect is Mwarimu's involvement in the fight against colonialism elsewhere in Africa. The, the ambassador mentioned it, uh, and Tanzania uh, laid the struggle for independence of other countries. And I think this is one area which needs a lot of a more, more study on the contribution and the sacrifice that Tanzania and Af other Africans made. But one could also pose a question that you had Malawi in the front line, but it was not a front line state, which was an independent African country. So it was not necessarily natural for a country to become in the front line of the liberation uh, struggle in Africa. But Tanzania chose and led by Mwalimu. And one could even ask a question, uh, if we didn't have Mwalimu, um, would Tanzania become a bastion of liberation of Africa as it is known today? That's a question that I leave it for, for discussion. So that's another aspect because Mwalimu believed that colonialism is universally a bad system and it has to be rejected and fought against. And there is a quote which I would like to share with you. Uh, Mwalimu says that colonialism implies inferiority of the colonized and acceptance of it means an automatic limit to self-respect. End of quote. And there is this other long quote, which I would also want to read, that why you should fight in, against uh, colonialism. If you are independent Tanganyika, why should you be fighting the war of the Mozambicans or the, the Zimbabweans, etc.? And Mwalimu says that those who governed us 
felt that they had a right, a genetical right, to govern us. If the right to govern was based on gene, the misfortune of being governed was also being based on gene. If the independence of Mozambique was being still questioned by the Portuguese on the basis of gene, certainly the Portuguese were not accepting the independence of Tanzania. They would be tolerating it, but not accepting it. And so it was important to complete the independence of Tanzania. You had to work together with the people of Mozambique to get rid of the Portuguese or teach them a lesson, end of quote. So that's another aspect of Marim uh, fighting against uh, systems that are oppressive, exploitative, and humiliating to human beings. But there is another aspect um, that Buanimo was concerned with. Okay, domestically, I have tried to touch on, but also in the region in terms of liberation struggle, but Mualimu was concerned with the international system and how divisive it was. Uh, the clip, as I said, assists me to uh, quickly shed light on, on this. Um, and Mualimu completes, and he, there is a sentence where he says, this has to be changed and it must be changed. Now, the modalities of change. What is the method of change? When it comes to liberation struggle, Mwalimu accepted the use of violence as a means of struggle, as a means of changing and uh, not removing a, a, an oppressive uh, system. And at the international level, one of the approach was for Mwalimu to mobilize um, other uh, countries, other nations, and he was involved in many initiatives. And one I will mention quickly was the uh, call for new international economic order in the 1970s, new international economic order. But the last initiative that he was involved is the South South. Uh, commission, which was trying to find a solution of the thaws on how to promote their, uh, to get solution to their problem without depending on the North. And this happened because uh, the North and the thaws were involved in a dialogue, and the dialogue was on changing the existing economic order, and that collapsed. If you remember, some of you who may recall, it was 1980. Mexico Cancun, there was a conference between the North and the Thaos, and it didn't work, it collapsed, and the Thaos was compelled to look for a solution from the Thaos. And one of the things that was proposed was that the Thaos must cooperate among themselves and seek a Thaos collective self-reliance uh, to, 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 to read to get rid of the existing system and free themselves from it. And finally, um, it's Mualimu's call for the oppressed to rebel. And this is in the speech to the Mali criminal sisters. Mualimu was making a call to the church, to the people of the souls, and any institution which matters, that you have to make a choice. One, on whose side are you? Are you on the side of the oppressor or on the side of the oppressed? And what should be done? And to Mwalimu, what should be done was, and I think still is, to rebel against the oppressive uh, system. Um, and Mwalimu had different ways of pushing his agenda. And I would like to complete by reading you a quotation of a, a conclusion of Mualimu's speech at the United Nations uh, in 1985. That was his final speech at the UN. And Mualimu said, and I want to read this to you because Mualimu never kept silent whenever injustice happened and wherever injustice 
happened. And Mwalim said uh, the following. Um, okay, it's here. To be silent, you might have heard it. To be silent when we see danger. To refrain from attacking policies which we see to be contrary to the interests of peace and justice. To do those things would be to surrender our freedom and our dignity. That we shall never do. Thank you very much. Another round of applause. Asante, Dr. <laughs> Sorry because, uh, I mean, we are running out of time. Sometimes we say there is time in Africa, but it seems we are outside Africa, even though we are talking of the, I mean, this big person from Africa. So thank you so much. And it is very true that we are working on the shoulders of great personalities. And knowing our history is fundamental. So thank you so, so much. I guess um, we deserve a break, eh? What do you say? Hmm? 20 break, I'm at Tubaki. But you see, right now, I cannot even speak the, 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 the small Swahili I know because Balozi <laughs> Yako. Okay, so we, we are going for a very short, 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 short break, 10 minutes, and we will start at exactly 16 45, okay? So once again, the washrooms for ladies are at our right, just right at the corner on your right as soon as you get out of, the, of, of, this, of this building. And the ones for men are parallel at the opposite, okay? In case you want some coffee, some tea, some whatever it may be, the co coffee shop is just before you enter to the washrooms of, of men, okay? So you can even check some information from there because, uh, I mean, the Gregorian students are here. So Asante me and feel at home. Ujama, eh? the Ujama spirit. Uh, thank you so much also for those who are connected, those who are online. Asante me and feel at home. We are going for break for 10 minutes. At 16.45, we are back. OK, thank you uh, to Dr. Kamata for that wonderful paper. Buonasera. Uh, na uh, kwa marafiki zangu wa Tanzania, asante sana kwa kuja karabuni. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the organizers, so um, Ange, Ro Rosine, Temple, Maureen, and Maria, and most especially to Father Albert and to uh, Father Festo, for inviting me here and giving me such a warm and wonderful welcome. I just want to say that it is an honor uh, for me to be here. I have much respect for the mission and the work of the Jesuit order, and it is a joy for me to be at the Greg. So I teach at a Jesuit university in Denver, Colorado, um, in, in the United States, and I often tell people that I identify as Jesuit I am just not an official member of the Society of Jesus. <laughs> now, even though uh, he is not well known to today's generation, Julius Nyerere was one of the most significant figures of 20th century Africa and was a leader of the Global South. He is maybe most well known for becoming the anti-colonial nationalist leader of Tanganyika and later president of the United Republic of Tanzania. But his influence went beyond Tanzania. Nyerere was a key facilitator in liberation struggles of Southern Africa, as we heard earlier. And he was also important to the region for being one of the loudest, strongest, longest, most principled anti-racism and anti-apartheid champions. He embraced leadership roles in the Pan-African and non-aligned movements. And in his later years, he was commissioner of the South Commission and a key figure in attempts to create economic solidarity in the Global South. Beyond his leadership positions, 
Julius Nyerere is often considered Africa's philosopher king par excellence. And many scholars have noted how he was one of the deepest and most globally minded thinkers of Africa's post-independence leaders. His political philosophy known as Ujamaa, United Family, was the most robust vision of African socialism of its time and will be analyzed further momentarily. And yet, despite the hundreds of pages written examining the political thought of Julius Nyerere and his Ujamaa philosophy, Thomas Speer pointed out that very few historians have explored how his political thought was influenced by Catholic social and political philosophy. For even though Nyerere was most well known for his national and continental political leadership, he was also an inquisitive Catholic and a devoted layman who was deeply shaped by his faith. So like Leopold Sanger of uh, Senegal, um, Julius Nyerere considered a vocation as a priest in his youth. And throughout his life, he devoted much of his time to the translation of Christian texts, having translated two catechisms, a hymnal, the weekly epistle and gospel readings from for mass into his native Kizanaki at the beginning of his political career. And then after uh, retiring from the presidency, he translated all four of the gospels and the acts of the apostles into Kiswahili verse. Now, Nyerere read, engaged and wrestled with Catholic writers and incorporated and reformulated some of those ideas into his own thoughts on humanity's purpose and the role of domestic and global politics. Now, later I will make the argument that not only was Nyerere shaped by his faith, but in many ways, he was also a powerful lay leader who shaped and influenced the Catholic Church in the Global South and Catholicism more broadly in the late 20th century. Now, my first of two aims is to give some insight into the Catholic roots of Nyerere's political thought, and then share my thoughts on his influence and impact on the global Catholic Church. Now, my starting point is uh, John Earle's uh, observation that historians of Africa have compartmentalized African intellectuals' political thinking and religious thought when in reality, Africans blurred the lines between European religious and political epistemologies. Not only did Nyerere blur the lines, but this trend of compartmentalization is clear in the sizable literature on Nyerere. While there have been a small handful of theologians who have produced excellent studies on how Nyerere's thought intersected with liberation theology or Catholic teaching, Almost all historians and sociologists who have looked into the intellectual origins of Nyerere's political thought have focused on only one of two um, aspects of his intellectual biography, highlighting either his upbringing in the uh, cultural milieu of his rural Zanaki community in the 1920s and 1930s, or they have pointed to the ways in which Nyerere was influenced by the ideas of a series of European writers, scholars, and mentors during his time at Makerere and Edinburgh universities. Now, in these studies, they forefront his interaction with the Western political canon, including thinkers like Plato, Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, Adam Smith, and J.S. Mill, and yet, the most numerous and worn out books in Nyerere's personal library included works by Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, a French idealist philosopher and Jesuit priest, Jacques Maritain, another French philosopher whose works on human rights were formational in the creation of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and Hans Kuhn, a German-speaking Swiss priest theologian, and ethicist. Indeed, Nyerere had four bookcases full of religious texts, including papal encyclicals, works on church history, and books written by third world theologians like Gustavo Gutierrez. And when one matches the annotations and underlying passages in these books with the 400 plus extant writings and speeches of Nyerere, it becomes clear that religious ideas 
whether he attributed them as such or not, permeated the political thought of Julius Nyerere. Now, this constitutes undoubtedly a third and important, and I would argue neglected, strand of Nyerere's political thought, to which historians should pay much more attention. Now, it is my assertion that the two most central concepts in the corpus of Nyerere's works are human dignity and equality. When one reads the words of Nyerere, it is clear that either human dignity or human equality, which are linked in his conception, are used as the justification for fighting for independence and African unity, and fighting against racism and the apartheid regime, against neocolonialism, neoliberalism, and the policies of the IMF. These concepts also served as the basis for his education policy, foreign policy, and his policy of self-reliance. They were central to Ujamaa, the Arusha Declaration, and nation building. And later in his career, he used these concepts to back up his stances on multi-partyism, environmental issues, and a new world economic order. And even though Nyerere's policies were not completely consistent over his long career, he did consistently draw from these concepts for inspiration in his political thinking and his decision making. While scholars like the distinguished Issa Shivji have noted that Nyerere uh, must have been influenced by his faith, saying, quote, it would be difficult to argue or believe that Nyerere was not influenced by religious considerations, these scholars often fail to closely examine how. If there is an examination into how Nyerere's religious commitments might have affected his political life, it is suggested that this influence only happened institutionally, for instance. Pressure by Catholic bishops in Tanzania, or possibly the influence of Catholic friends, which could have shaped particular policies. But this reading fails to grasp the depth to which the ideas of Catholic writers, right, people whom Nyerere never met, um, how those ideas could have influenced him and shaped his worldview and specific political ideas. Again, while Shivji acknowledges that Nyerere's conception of African socialism was based on an idealist construct, which was derived from his morality and his ethics and not on classical socialism, he seems to fail to see the extent to which those notions of morality and ethics centering on human dignity and equality were based on Nyerere's faith and his deep reading of Catholic writers. Now, I only have time to give one brief case study, and so I will focus on the works of Jacques Maritain and his rich conceptions of the role of human dignity in political society. Now, Nyerere first encountered Jacques Maritain uh, while studying at Makerere in the 1940s. And he continued to purchase and read his books until the death of the philosopher in the late 19, or early 1970s. Now, Jacques Maritain was arguably the most well-known Catholic uh, philosopher of Nyerere's day, and his views on the relationship between state, society, and human persons were based on what he called an integral humanism. This was a form of theistic humanism that noted that all human beings or persons have both material and spiritual dimensions. And politics should take this into account for helping humans to develop integrally and to live fully human lives. Indeed, Maritain argued that the highest purpose of political society, which he saw as above the political state, and the state was subservient to political society, is to, quote, better the conditions of human life itself or to procure the common good for the multitude, end quote. Now, because he believed the human person was for political society and the political society was for the human person, the state was to be an instrument in the service of man. This was known as his instrumentalist theory of genuine political notion of the state. Now, if the state is for man and is to work for the common good, 
How did Maritain understand the common good and the purpose of a political society? Well, the fundamental concepts here were the notions of human dignity and equality, which were based on the Christian idea of Imago Dei, or all were created in the image of God. And from these two most sacred principles flowed the notion of justice and freedom, as one cannot be fully human and have dignity if there's injustice and tyranny. Therefore, there's this back and forth flow between individual persons and the multitude of persons who make up the whole of society. And when Maritain says that the chief aim of political society is to serve the common good, he means the concrete ways in which all can be fully human. So this means states are obliged to protect human rights and human freedom as he defines it and attempt the equitable distribution of the material things that support human dignity. Maritain's integral humanism did not exclude any particular form of government as long as it maintained policies that promoted dignity. For him, it was not the liberal individualistic type of society nor the communist type of society that could best promote human dignity, though both theoretically could, but it was what he called the personalistic type of society which would, quote, see the mark of human dignity first and foremost in the power to make these same goods of nature serve the common conquest of intrinsically human, moral, and spiritual goods and of man's freedom and a, of autonomy. Beyond the nation state level, Maritain envisioned a future world society based on the dignity and, uh, of the human person and which was directed towards the ideal of human brotherhood, where all could live and work together in a worldwide society in which the global common good would supersede a sense of common good peculiar to each political society, or as we saw earlier today, heard earlier today, an ethnicity or any other grouping. Now, the one thread that runs throughout Nyerere's entire career is his application of the integral humanist vision of human dignity. As early as 1958, he declared that in the independent struggle was to, quote, add to the world some total of freedom and human dignity. And he later reminded Tanganyikans in his Independence Day message that, quote, our struggle was based on our belief in the equality and dignity of all of mankind. Indeed, he reiterated this point a week later at uh, an address to the United Nations when he promised that as Tanganyika began the process of nation building, that, quote, the basis of our actions will be an honest attempt to honor the dignity of man. When it came to constructing a state society relationship, Nyerere explicitly stated Maritain's ideal that, quote, man is the purpose of all social activ activity the service of man, and in fact, the purpose of society itself. The betterment of man was based on the achievement of human dignity, and thus the state could serve as an instrument to safeguard human dignity and the sacredness of his life force. Nyerere elsewhere went on to argue that, quote, the purpose of government is to secure for the people in which they can live happily and peacefully, because the conditions of which many of the people now live um, and move are a negation of human dignity. And from this flowed many state building policies. When it came to what the government of Tanzania should do for its citizens, Nyerere noted that there was, quote, no human dignity in extreme poverty or debilitating disease, nor in ignorance. And this led Nyerere to famously argue that the first fight of Tanzanian society would be to battle poverty, disease, and ignorance through economic and educational programs. For Nyerere then, like Maritain, there was a clear link between human dignity and issues of social justice. He stated in 1963 that there was, quote, no doubt that for reasons of human dignity and for the sake of peace and justice, the economic inequalities in the world must be reduced and the mass of people must be able to relieve themselves from the burden of poverty. The fight for economic justice then would have to be tackled both domestically and internationally. When it came to domestic politics, once again, integral humanism was at the heart of his signature political ideology, Ujamaa socialism. And in some of his most succinct statements on his understanding of socialism, 
um, he made this clear. And I will just leave these quotes for you all to read. Now, thus, uh, the very first two statements of the Tanu Creed, one of the documents that made up the Arusha Declaration, were that Tanu believed that all human beings were created equal and that every individual had a right to dignity and respect. Thus, Nyerere's views of socialism were based on a type of personalism where the common good of the whole was based on the human flourishing and dignity of persons. Naturally, this foundation on human rights uh, and social justice flowed into Nyerere's foreign policy as well. As Nyerere himself said, quote, the struggle for human equality and human dignity cannot stop at national boundaries. Even before Tanganyikan independence, Nyerere's argument for the end of white rule in Rhodesia and apartheid in South Africa were based on human dignity. Time and time again in the international arena, he reminded his audience that these policies in Southern Africa were an affront to human dignity. And he implored the Commonwealth that the dignity of man was the idea that could defeat racism. And he drew a new battle line calling these racist regimes the enemies of freedom and dignity. When it came to the Cold War confrontation, once again, Nyerere made clear that since they were, quote, trying to create a society on human dignity and human equality, that they had to support non-alignment and both political and economic growth. In the years spent fighting for economic solidarity in the South, uh, for more uh, international, more just international economic systems, Nyerere's thought, again, was based on dignity. This is why he didn't want charity from the wealthy North and why he wanted development plans that were human-centered. People achieve dignity through work, not by begging. But at the same time, there was no dignity when there was so much economic injustice in the world. Indeed, by the 1990s, he had expanded his view to a more global outlook where he thought all nations were affected by the failures to uphold human dignity. And he called for the reform of the UN and a return to the principles, its first principles of equality and dignity. In the end, he thought if they were going to build a world society that was marked by peace, we would have to be able to find common purpose for the planet. And this could only be done once we learned to talk and work together in a spirit of mutual respect and dignity. In summing up this section, I think Nyerere is a unique example of when a Catholic lay thinker was in the position to reimagine the nature and future of the state altogether. Due to his popularity as the leader of the nationalist movement in Tanzania, his perceived international reputation, and his universally recognized strengths of character, being honest, principled, and intelligent, amongst other factors, Nyerere largely had a free hand to mold the political philosophy and some of the policies of the new nation. One of the arguments I make in the larger project um, is that um, th through his Ujamaa political ideology, which was thoroughly infused with Catholic concepts, Tanzania could be seen as the clearest attempt to implement Catholic social notions of human dignity and equality into the creation of a political and economic system in the 20th century. This, however, was never overt, as at no time did uh, Nyerere call this a Catholic or a Christian ideology, um, but the ideas themselves consistently proved a motivating factors in Nyerere's shaping of policy. Um, the second major point I want to make is that Nyerere helped in shaping Catholic thinking in both the global south and the global north. In the third world, or global south, Nyerere played a key role in shaping the movement for third world theologians. So Nyerere's attempt to bring human dignity and equality to the poor inspired liberation theologians such as Gustavo Gutierrez and Sergio Torres. And Nyerere was instrumental in establishing the first General Assembly of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, or ITWAT, in Dar es Salaam in 1976. Nyerere was an active participant in this seminal conference, uh, sometimes referred to as the Bandung of Theology, which helped formulate a third world theology based on contextualized Christianity that focused on the world's poor and oppressed 
and helped assist in shifting the larger theological conversation towards the global south. Sergio Torres, the first secretary of Eat Wat, uh, argued that, quote, Ujama sparked the imagination of third world theologians, meeting in the context of the post-independence period. He wrote that Tanzania was chosen as the host country for the conference as a salute to the heroic task of socioeconomic development this country is undertaking, which is profoundly human, and at the same time, faithful to the best of African traditions. He went on to write that Ujama was, quote, a real source of attraction and admiration for all those who ask questions about the future and the role of Christians in the developing world. Now, Julius Nyerere did not just serve as, as a dignitary opening the ceremony, although he was the only uh, head of state ever to do so, but he actively engaged in the conversations and gave his own talk as well. And to the gathered theologians, he made the thought-provoking statement that, quote, true liberation has not started in Africa, nor have people in the continent fully grasped its real meaning. In reference to the need for a future that was more integrated politically and economically and socially. And the chief historian of the uh, Etwat movement says that, quote, uh, the theologians were challenged to locate a theological language to express the yearning for the true freedom of which Nyerere was reminding them. Now, outside of the South, I want to humbly submit that Nyerere's ideas had an influence on the thinking and writing of both Pope John, uh, excuse me, both Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II. While Nyerere undoubtedly drew heavily from both popes, which I talk about elsewhere, um, here I'm some suggesting that it was a two-way street of influence. Though uh, more search needs to be redone, uh, done, it is clear that at a general level at least, the church became more aware of Africa's problems in the second half of the 20th century. And as the most high profile and articulate member who was able to explain these phenomenon, um, Nyerere clearly had an influence on Catholic recognition for particular injustices and the needs of Africans and people of the South more generally. Um, and since I'm running out of time, uh, two quick pieces of evidence on how Nyerere uh, more directly shaped Catholic teaching. As I mentioned earlier, um, Nyerere's famous fight against ignorance, poverty, and disease had been a rallying cry of his since 1960, so the year before independence. And he explained this theme to include, or I should say he expanded this theme to include the whole world uh, when he gave the McDougall uh, Memorial Lecture at the Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, of the United Nations here in Rome in November of 1963. He argued that for reasons of human dignity and for the sake of peace and justice, the economic inequalities in the world must be reduced and the mass of the people must be able to relieve themselves from the burden of poverty. Now, in direct response to this and explicitly recognizing Nyerere's speech as the inspiration, the FAO sent a resolution to the UN General Assembly in New York. Um, saying that they needed to do something about Nyerere's call to fight hunger, disease, and ignorance. This received a broad endorsement in New York, and the world campaign against hunger, disease, and poverty was born. Now, two years later, in 1965, in an address to the United Nations, Pope Paul VI called for the need to conquer illiteracy, give modern health service, and put the resources of science, technology, and organization in the service of humanity to alleviate poverty and stimulate true development. He argued that this was the way to build peace. Indeed, this fight against hunger, poverty, disease, and ignorance became the central focus of his most prominent social encyclical, Populorum Progressio, in 1967, where he echoed Nyerere's call for people-centered development which he announced was an object of deep interest and concern to the church. Now, coming from the perspective that development and justice and peace were all interlinked, 
Um, Populorum Progressio also promoted a new pontifical commission for justice and peace. Now, one writer uh, has noted that this was the first time that an encyclical was not written from a predominantly European point of view, but one in which the whole world was front and center. Now, what you may not know is that the day after Nyerere's McDougal lecture, um, Nyerere met Pope Paul and had a private audience with him for about an hour when presumably they talked about such issues. Now, more directly, we know that when the Pope spoke at the FAO in 1970, where again he spoke of uh, the hunger for bread and education and the thirst for dignity, he specifically credited the sessions at the FAO in November of 1963, when Yerere spoke, as igniting his sustained entrance in that struggle. The director of uh, Justice and Peace Commission later even said that Tanzania and Yerere had helped contribute to that body's understanding of justice. Now, in the case of John Paul II, who Nyerere met several times, um, the Pope was very taken with Nyerere and his Ujamaa philosophy, which John Paul praised for promoting a true sense of brotherhood and universal solidarity. But when it comes to the transfer of ideas and drawing a direct connection between Nyerere and John Paul II, one can point to the report of the South Commission in 1990 called The Challenge of the South, which you can see Nyerere giving here to um, John Paul. And this document laid out the need for economic unity in the South and called out the unjust international economic system and the debts that were crippling Southern economies. His critique was, of course, based on human dignity. Um, and in John Paul II's uh, encyclical, uh, Centesimus Annus, and his speech before the UN in 1995, we can clearly see a shift away from the East-West conflict to the burgeoning conflict between the North and South. And John Paul II addressed issues of uh, debt and underdevelopment, the need for constraints on international financial institutions to promote human-centered economics and the effects of neocolonialism in post-colonial societies, all of which Nyerere had explored in depth in the challenge to the South and elsewhere. In Centanimus Annus, Pope John Paul II thanked all of those who, spurred on by the social magisterium, had sought to make that teaching the inspiration of their involvement in the world. Acting either as individuals or joined together in organizations, these people represented a great movement for the defense of the human person and the safeguarding of human dignity. And I think John Paul II likely had uh, Tanzania's soulful politician in mind when acknowledging these efforts. To close, I put forth uh, that this shift in Catholic social teaching can be discerned more recently uh, in both the works of Benedict and the writings of Pope Francis that we are remembering today, uh, Evangelii uh, Gaudium and Fratelli Tutti. Concerns over foreign debt, crippling human society, a sustained focus on the global common good, the need for international justice to create and sustain universal fraternity, can all be seen clearly throughout these two encyclicals. And while Nyerere is certainly not solely responsible for these areas of focus, our little teacher from Butiama had some role in reshaping Catholic social thought and inspiring a more moral vision for our future. Thank you. Thank you for the light. I just wanted to see the I mean, the faces of each and every one of you, because I'm reading, I mean, it is my feeling, and I guess I can read from your faces that, I mean, you wanted more from him. <laughs> Do I err? Is that not true? Yes. <laughs> uh, where is the dean? <laughs> OK, so let us just turn our heads towards the Dean of the Faculty of Social, Social Sciences, and let us ask him to bring in again. I mean, we need him. <laughs> now, because this time is too short, and congratulations, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Sanders, because, I mean, if you can check, I mean, it's an entire history. You cannot just, I mean, coming from which, how many encyclical? 
Did somebody, I mean, did you count how many were mentioned? Did you? Well, how many? Anastasia, are you serious? Are you serious? Okay, so thank you so, so much. Thank you really. And uh, I guess Father La will do something because we need, I mean, my, my colleagues from the do, uh, social doctrine of the church will be there, I mean, wanting more and more and more and more, especially from this point of view. So allow me to welcome our next speaker. Dr. Mkenda, karibu sana ndugu yangu. It's going to, the title of his talk is Francis Nyerere, Francis Nyerere and Politics as a Space of Human Encounter. You need more? He's here with you. Karibu. Thank you very much. Allow me to begin by thanking the organizers of this uh, colloquium um, and for having me present this paper. They made me work and do some reflection on this very important topic, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And thank you all for coming here. Seeing you all encourages me and makes me understand how important this subject is. And I want to thank my two colleagues who spoke before me for really uh, setting the scene in uh, such a spectacular way. They have made my work easy so that I can only build on what they have already said about Julius Nyerere. And for that reason, I think I can begin with something slightly different. On September 16th, 2013, just about three months into his papacy, Pope Francis gave a homily in the chapel of Sacasa Santa Marta, in which he asked his hearers to pray for politicians that they govern us well. The Pope highlighted two essential attitudes of a ruler and painted for his hearers the profile of a good politician, what he would later call a politician with soul. The two attitudes were love and humility. A ruler who does not love cannot govern, the Pope said, indicating that love allowed for better service of the loved people. Furthermore, Pope Francis said humility allowed the ruler to hear the opinions of others so as to choose the best way of governing them. The, the homily of Pope Francis touched many people and many news channels uh, wrote about it. This, his remarks, his most potent remarks that many people celebrated came towards the end of that homily. When he shifted attention from the ruler, the politician, if you will, or the, the, the governor, to the one, to those who are governed, to citizens decrying mainstream reporting that rallies primary, primarily on abusing politicians, the Pope longed for a different kind of reporting that would say, this leader has done well in this, and this leader has done has this virtue. He, has wrong, he, has, he was wrong in this, but, in, but this he did well. In this way, Francis laid the ground for the last, last parts of the homily, which contained a statement that virtually went viral. He said, and I quote, sometimes we hear a good Catholic is not interested in politics. This is not true, the Pope said. Good Catholics immerse themselves in politics by offering the best of themselves so that the leader 
can govern, end of quote. The Pope further emphasized that, and I quote, politics according to the social doctrine of the church is one of the highest forms of charity because it serves the common good, end of quote. We can clearly see that Pope Francis, for Pope Francis, politics is a noble calling that extends to all, and good Catholics cannot wash their hands and stand by as if, as if to avoid the dirty game. Besides the Vatican News that published uh, a paraphrase of the Pope's homily, several other news outlets covered it on the same day. La Stampa did so under the title, A Good Catholic Medals in Politics. Catholic News Agency also covered the homily, saying the Pope rejected the idea that a good Catholic does not meddle in politics. Reporting in the digital edition of the Time magazine, Elizabeth Diaz put it simply, today the Pope had a political message on, on his mind, meddle in politics. Soon, a good Catholic medals in politics became the most recognizable title for the Pope's message. With time, Longer reflections and opinion pieces based on the Pope's invitation to meddle in politics were also published, showing there was a genuine need for this kind of discussion in Catholic circles. Writing in the Times of Malta on May 15, 2016, under the title, Good Catholics Do Meddle, Maltese priest and journalist Joe Borg included in his opinion piece more reflections from Pope Francis, and these he had shared later in, with Italy's Christian life community in 1915. Paraphrasing the Pope, Borg said, and I quote at length here, Francis is realistic that the world of politics can be tough, especially when there is so much corruption. It is a kind of martyrdom, he said, where one carries the cross of the ideal of the common good every day without letting yourself be corrupted or discouraged in the midst of failure. Francis acknowledged that it is difficult to be in the middle of it all without getting your hands dirty. This should not discourage one, he said. Ask the Lord to help you not sin, but if you get your hands dirty, ask for forgiveness and keep going. Don't get discouraged, end of quote. In conclusion, Borg said, strong and inspiring words indeed for all those honest people who militate in different political parties, end of quote. Now, it is my intention to propose Julius Nyerere as one, on, one of the honest people in recent history who militated in complex political situations. Before I do so, however, I wish to point out that Pope Francis has said a lot more on the subject of politics rather than just his medal in politics, homily. In chapter four, the chapter four of his exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, which was published just nine weeks after the medal in politics homily, this chapter treats political involvement much more broadly. Titled The Social Dimension of Evangelization, the chapter links charity with politics. Like in the rest of the exhortation, in this chapter one can discern a certain outward movement that is propelled by an inner person, personal connection with the gospel. At the very heart of the gospel, the Pope says, is life in community and engagement with others. Yet, 
besides, uh, out, besides what pushes one from within, there is also a force that attracts one from outside. And this, this is the infinite dignity conferred upon every woman and man, which obliges one to do good, or as it's often said, at least to refrain from doing harm to others. Francis says, from the heart of the gospel, we see the profound connection between evangelization and human advancement, which must necessarily find expression and develop in every work of evangelization, end of quote. It is in this chapter four of Evangelii Gaudium that Francis pray, pray, prays for more politicians who are genuinely disturbed by the state of society, the people who lives, who the people, the lives of the poor. It is here that he urges government leaders and financial leaders to take heed and broaden their horizons, working to ensure that all citizens have dignity, dig, dig, dignified work, education, and health care. And it is when all this is done that, quote, we begin to see nurses with soul, teachers with soul, politicians with soul. By this, Francis means people who have chosen deep down to be with others and for others. Again, it is my intention to propose Julius Nyerere as one such person. In 1920, seven years after Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis returned to this important theme of politicians and political involvement. Quote, whereas individuals can help others in need, when, when they join together in initiating social processes of fraternity and justice for all, for all they enter the field of charity at its most vast, namely political charity, end of quote. Continuing, the Pope said that this kind of initiative entails working for a social and political order where soul, whose soul is social charity. Rather touchingly, he adds, once more, I appeal for renewed appreciation of politics as a lofty vocation and one of the highest forms of charity in, a, in as much as it is, it is seeks the common good. Now, listening to all these appeals from the Pope, one cannot but ask the question, is there a crisis in politics? In fact, this is a question to which uh, Pope Francis' response is affirmation, is affirmative. We find ourselves wondering whether there is something wrong. In fact, Francis says in Fratelli Tutti that, quote, for many people today, politics is a distasteful word often due to the mistakes, corruption, and inefficiency of some politicians. There are also attempts to discredit politics, to replace it with economics, or to twist it to one ideology or another." End of quote. Nyerere allows us to demonstrate that, despite the corruption that exists, one can still be an honest politician. In the course of preparing this presentation, I learned that the crisis in politics is actually old and is still endemic, even today. In the 1950s, prominent American political scientist Morris Klein surveyed college student opinions about politics. His findings are as telling as they are amusing. He says responses, were, re responses never vary. I will quote him at length, and he says, a scattering of students attempt a definition 
A few other scribble terms like government, candidates, and elections, but most rip off comments which betray considerable feeling. They paper not sheets with a dirty business and similar pejoratives. When I hear what when I hear that word, I feel like spitting, another said. Wire pulling and underhanded dealings, another said. Dog eat dog, another one said. Where connections count more than ability, another student says. Corruption, graft, dirt, it stinks, and so on, end of quote. Klein also asked his students what they thought about politicians. The practitioner of politics, the politician, is assaulted with the same basic English said Klein. And I quote again at some length. He is mauled by sneer, smeared, is mauled and smeared with the student's favorite political adjectives, dirty. The politician will do anything, no matter how dirty, to get what he is after. If you call me a politician, smile. Slings the dirt to harm others, boost himself. Swindler, big stomach, big cigar, big promises, big wind, dirty guy. When he's around, Better hold your nose, end of court. Surprisingly, or rather shockingly, Klein's findings from almost 70 years ago sound as if they were from a survey carried out during our time. Writing in 2010 with reference to Britain, Matthew Flinders, professor of politics at the University of Sheffield, says, and I quote, Public opinion surveys suggest that large sections of the public are more distrustful, disengaged, and skeptical, and disillusioned with politics than ever before. Politics, for the many rather than just a few, has become a dirty word, conjuring up notions of sleaze, corruption, greed, inefficiency, end of quote. Flinders continues to say that at the time he was writing, just a few years ago, 90% of the British public distrusted politicians. Artists, especially cartoonists, communicate this sobering reality well and also supply much needed comic relief. In one of his political cartoons, Tanzanian artist Godfrey Mwampembwa, who is usually known as Gado, has an official enter a Kenyan president's office and say, quote, Your Excellency, the report says a cabinet minister, a governor, two MPs, and four influential businessmen are involved in poaching and ivory smuggling, end of quote. Rather than being shocked, the president responded, and I quote, ah, include them in my entourage for my coming trip to China. <laughs> Another cartoonist, um, Nigerian Chigbu Joshua, is even more earthier in his depiction of politicians, which means I could not present what he says before this polite audience here without editing it. Joshua has a young man and a young woman meet for the first time. The man introduces himself as a politician by profession and an honest man. In obvious surprise, disbelief, the woman responds saying something akin to, quote, I am a thief and an innocent person. <laughs> These cases suffice to demonstrate that a crisis has lingered in politics for, very long, for a very long time. 
Thankfully, it has not been an unmitigated crisis. As one author who writes anonymously reminds us, quote, cynics may focus on politics as a winner-take-all game, irreconcilable conflict where anything goes and no one can be trusted. But he says, quote again, optimists may focus on politics as a collaborative, collaborative effort by which we make mutual, mutual gains that are shared among us all, end of quote. It becomes obvious that in spite of realities that orient us toward political cynicism, Pope Francis is inviting us to regard humanity's lofty vocation with optimism. The life of Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere allows us to demonstrate that Francis's political optimism is not directed to some sham utopia that hangs somewhere between the sea and the blue sky, but to a political reality that has been lived by someone right here on earth. Nyerere allows us to show that in spite of the mistakes, corruption, and inefficiency of some politicians, it is possible to carry the cross of the ideal of the common good every day without letting oneself be, oneself be corrupted or discouraged in the midst of failure, a kind of martyrdom as Pope Francis himself describes it. It is important that we understand Nyerere's life within its proper historical context. As a freedom fighter and first generation leader in post-colonial Africa, Nyerere, like others in that category, was faced with a myriad of temptations, among which three stand out. Power, money, and tribalism. I would like to begin with power. The first leaders of independent Africa inherited enormous powers from the departing colonial regimes. The colonial state was totalitarian in principle. It controlled the populations that were subject to foreign rulers and laws. Africans were what the British called protected persons, presumably unable to look after themselves. Such colonial subjects were not citizens with civil or political rights. For these reasons, post-colonial statecraft entailed incul inculcating a sense of citizenship among freed masses. Moreover, post-colonial statecraft in Africa succeeded only to the extent that heirs of the colonial state agreed to relinquish some of their inherited powers. Put differently, the project succeeded only to the extent that leaders were humble, as Pope Francis recommends, in order to hear the opinions of others and to choose the best way of governing them. As Francis would say again, one who relied on raw power can at most make a bit of order, but he or she cannot govern. A tendency to return to power in face of, uh, of opposition was probably Nyerere's greatest temptation. I think it is possible to say that if ever Nyerere had a thorn in his flesh, then it was this inclination to rely on power. His constant struggle with this vice produced a complex character, which is well described by Professor Saida Yahaya Othman, a lead author of the first volume of, the first of the three volumes co-authored with uh, Dr. Kamata and Professor Isa Shivji. Yahaya Othman's description is worth reproducing here at some length, and I quote, 
Nyerere felt the pain and hunger of the masses just as a father feels that of his children. He did all that he could from above through the state to alleviate them with reasonable, if, roaring, if not roaring success. Like an authoritarian father, he never allowed the masses to rebel against those who caused them pain and hunger. Centralization of power from above and suppression of spontaneity from below combined with an impeccable personal integrity constituted his popular politics. Popular, yes, but not populist. For Nyerere did not simply follow the masses, nor did he whip up their primordial sentiments. He aroused them to think for themselves, but not think freely. He led the masses often, perhaps too often by the nose. He commented to the Merinol sisters that development of the people constituted a rebellion, but when rebels reared their heads in his own country, he suppressed them decisively, end of quote. In the context of Nyerere's complex relationship with power, what Professor Yaya Othman says next is probably the most important here. And he says, Nyerere often emerged triumphant, but frequently backed down. Given more time, I believe it could be demonstrated that where Nyerere backed down, it was because he realized his, idea, his ideas meant nothing if they ultimately did not serve the humanity. He argued as both urgent and, and goal of true development. It is also true that as we watch Nyerere struggle to relate with power, we see a lived experience of the resilience Pope Francis calls for. As reported by Borg, Francis admits it is difficult to be in the middle of it all without getting your hands or heart a little dirty. But the Pope does not think that, that this reality should discourage one. Ask the Lord, you remember, to help you not sin. But if you sin, ask for forgiveness and continue. Don't get discouraged. Unlike the temptation to power that posed a significant challenge to Nyerere, money and all that constitutes mammon was not a concern of his. Rather, it was a temptation he despised and conquered with ease. His success in this area placed him among, almost on a class of his own. Professor Yahya Othman again tells us that presidential contemporaries of Nyerere were amazed at what, they, what to them appeared to be Nyerere's neglect of personal comfort. An as an example, Yahya Othman tells a story of Kenneth Kaunda, former president of Zambia, who was convinced that the driver taking him to Nyerere's home in Butiama had lost his way when they were traversing a bumpy and dust road, dusty road. To Kaunda, as indeed to many others, the road leading to the residence of the head of state could not be in such a sorry state. In Nyerere's logic, however, the road leading to the head of state of the, of the, of the Tanzanian state needed not be different from average Tanzanian roads. There are many other similar examples and I need to wind down. There are many other similar instances which show that Nyerere almost really, which show Nyerere's almost religious attitude toward material wealth and its trappings. That these actually, this attitude lasted through his entire public life. In the early days of his presidency, he complained more than most that his presidential motorcade was a, was a nuisance to him personally 
and an unnecessary disruption of ordinary life across the city of Dar es Salaam. When he retired, the, bal the balance in his personal bank account was so modest that it made others feel embarrassed. He actually retired to an equally modest house in his rural home when, and when the Tanzanian military insisted on building, building for him a house befitting his stature, he complained almost like a child refusing to take his meals, insisting he was not an elephant to need a bigger house. The third and last uh, temptation is tribalism. This was a complex problem in post-colonial Africa, but for Nyerere, it was also one that he conquered with relative ease. Now, here I use the word tribalism in a, a very broad sense, meaning a tendency to give uncritical preference or support to members of a group with which one affiliates oneself for biological, cultural, or religious reasons, or really any other reasons. In this sense, all forms of nepotism regionalism or even religionism are all variants of tribalism. In Tanzania, as in many other places in Africa, the British used considerable effort to enclose culturally identifiable local communities into entities they called tribes. And this was for purposes of, their, of easy control. Creating a national citizenry beyond the limits of those tribes was one of Nyerere's immediate challenges after independence. His achievement in this area is considered by many to have been remarkable, as we have heard multiple times today. And this is because he led by example. Whereas several of his contemporary presidents sought to transform their rural villages into city, cities complete with international airports simply because they came from there, Nyerere did not think that his origins in Butiama were a strong enough reason for prioritizing a road leading to his home. In conclusion, I would like to propose that Pope Francis' ideas on politics and Julius Nyerere's practice of politics intersect where humanity finds its place at the center of both. Politics is the space where we can freely canvas and organize for human development and for the common good. Politics allows us to imagine a secure and secular public square where best ideas from all backgrounds, including religions, can be brought together for the sole purpose of seeking the common good. It is from here that, as Francis suggested in his Medal in Politics homily, a ruler bears the opinions of others, a ruler hears the opinions of others so as to choose the best way of governing them. For this to happen, Pope Francis suggests that humility and love are paramount virtues. In fact, both virtues come from a recognition of the immense and uh, indiminishable dignity of every human being. In politics, it does not seem to matter how one arrives at that recognition of human dignity, but it matters that one arrives there. For purposes of politics, a Christian and a Muslim, a person of Chaga ethnicity or of Sukuma ethnicity, a white person and a black person, all can pursue the common good together to the extent that they uphold the immense and indiminishable dignity of man and woman. Thank you very much. How many, are, how many are, of you are active politicians? Just wanted to know. How many of you are active politicians? 
Oh my goodness. Are you sure? How many of you are passive politicians? In which police do you live in? Okay. Anyhow, let us give a round of applause to Dr. Mkenda. I believe that after having listened attentively to the three speakers, we already know who we are called to be and where we are called, what we are called to do, whether active or passive politicians. We are students in the society, and I guess that if we are here, you and I have something to do as we go back to wherever we came from, okay? Your communities, our societies, our, whichever institutions we came from. And uh, let us change the tone of, uh, because these things are, were so serious. So right now, help me to welcome my sister, my young sister, Rosine Ange, who is going to recite a poem in honor of Mualimo Julius Nyerere. Karibu dadangu. Asante sana. That's the only one I, I can speak in Swahili. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Maureen. I'm going to recite the poem, which is called Let's Learn from Malimo. Actually, I wrote this poem after reading his two volume, because normally I write when I'm inspired. I'm not doing this poem for walking. No, I write one when I'm inspired. So when I was reading, I was taking notes, and then it became, it became a poem. Um, I got interest to know about him, because we were studying about him in history. But when it came here in this Gregorian University, it became more interesting to me. So here we go. The music, please. From the darkness we learn to raise the light Why not from star to the moon? From morning we learn to raise the beauty of peace Why not from beauty of history? From always blame, blame, blame complaints of expansionism Why not from belt, paradise, blooming freedom falls for you, Malimo? I am proud to be an African woman, came from beautiful land. When they see me, they inquire about conflict, corruption, poverty, teenager pregnancy, and so and so more negativity. I apologize, not here to that dance, in different read I find my chance. Today, I just want to tell you about Africa. I want to tell you about hero, a change maker. I want to honor their courage, the first step, the following steps for all of us. I want to learn, I want you to learn from a politician with a soul, a good influencer. In airports, yo, I existed not yet. In the honors time, I encountered thee through the pedestry of history. I cherish their, I cherish their valor, enamored by benevolence that grace their being. Inheriting the pedagogy, though bestowed, impairs our affection of roots. Now, as I grow up, I'm more inspired. As a followers, we follow who knows the road, all oh, the law, the servant. As a riders, as a riders, we based on them, their recognition matters. No matter how total is the slow, important is to arrive. No matter how long it will take, I hope it won't take centuries. 
together is good place to be. But how if the scale is still unbalanced? If love is theory from different books, essays, never read, not even put into practice? Only potentiality cannot raise the nation. For me, it is responsibility, responsibility to change through reality. Even if some powerful people use their people in the use of some paper kind of profitability, ignoring human rights, human beings, where they are treated like other beings without even equality, solidarity as icon of unity. Listen, heroes do not die. Teachers, too, find rest. In their absence, students' roles and power manifest. Marimu even received you in 1999. Up there, the choir songs the songs were coming, song home down here, all in tears. The rain of silence, bitter news spread from London to the world. Maria's heart shrank, the sickness of laws, praying to the Mary for strength, peace, protection, so harsh without you. Monthly year poets, arts, authors realize more about heroes. And then now we still honor you. Motivated we are, no doubt we keep pulling. Each and every prayer we say, Malimu Julius, pray for ours. Malimu means a teacher. You are a teacher of Africa, the teacher of the world, the president ever, the father of nation, a change maker. Ujama is the proof. Familyhood. Familyhood. Together. All of us together. Together better. Together better. Together we better build our Africa. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, Rosine. Thank you, really. If there is anything you could take out of this forum colloquium today is Ujama. Then you add the very many other talks which we had. We are fond of Ubuntu, the Ubuntu spirit. Add now the Ujama spirit. Then if you wish also, you can add the Harambe spirit. I mean, there are very many. It is the same, same, same. But today, connect the Ujama or familyhood. But why not Ujama? Is it hard? Can you repeat it? Ujama. Ujama. I, I guess it is very late in the evening and you really. Are you hungry? Can we repeat it? Ujama. 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 So whenever you think or you hear of Mwalimo, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, think of U. Perfect. You are good students. Now, somebody might be asking, but how come that maybe for the first time in the Gregorian University, Gregorian Pontifical University here in Rome, we are talking about Julius Kambarage Nyerere. I want to bring somebody here. You might have known him. You might be knowing him. But mm, he's not an African. But you see, when somebody is a, a, is a researcher a, for very many more other reasons, an anthropologist, then you may not help, not asking yourself, but why? And you go looking for the reasons to that why. So our. Our presence here today is owed to the remarkable Father Alejo from the Philippines, a Jesuit priest, distinguished anthropologist, and esteemed professor in the Faculty of the Social Sciences here in the Gregorian University. During his visit in Tanzania, wherever Father Alejo went, 
there was this profound reverence for Baba Wataifa Mwalimu Julius Kambarage. Yeah? Okay. And this sparked curiosity of an anthropologist because he is. But why? Why this man? Why all this reference? Ah, we in Baba Wetu. No, we in Baba Wetu. This is our father. I mean, a father to the entire nation. This one is saying father, father, father. So, how many children? No? Now, ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming Father Alejo, Albert Alejo, from the Gregorian University. Please, Father, the floor is yours. He will also lead us, give us some hint on how this came about, and I will give you some other information on what will come next. Meanwhile, prepare, instead of question answers session, we will be having a session where we will be sharing our experiences, maybe something, sa don't you need water, Father? Some water. Okay, so, so if, you, if there is something you would take home from this experience of today, then you can share with us. But just prepare that for now, okay, as we wait for the microphone. Is it on? Thank you. Karibu, Father. Yes. Is it working? Can we try it? <laughs> <laughs> to Sipu Yesu Christu. <laughs> so I'm Father Albert Alejo from the Philippines. I'm already standing, so it's all right. <laughs> anyway, last year I was, I went to Tanzania together with Father Gabriel Masi, and everywhere I went, I saw the picture of Julius Shirene. And every time I asked about him, people became, became solemn. Julius And so I began to ask around. And lo and behold, I discovered a book. And it turned out to be three volumes. So I snatched it from the sister and never returned them. <laughs> but as a, as a compensation, here we are. I think the spirit of Molimo Julius Nirere has moved us. Somebody said, why are you conducting it in the Aula Mania? Maybe only 30 people will come. There's not much interest in Africa. But look, behold, that deserves a clap. <laughs> I asked around, I asked around, and when I go back to Rome, who should I consult? And all the fingers pointed at Father uh, Festo Makenda. And I reached out to him. Can we have a forum? He said, that's difficult. But here we are. It's a reality. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, who will be our speakers? Well, uh, certainly one of the authors. And here we are listening to <laughs> Dr. Kamata. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Father, Ken, Father Festo Makenda also said, I know of American who did, uh, who has dedicated his uh, many years of studies on uh, Mualimu Julius Nyerere. And here he is. We did not pay for his trip. <laughs> <laughs> now for this open forum, uh, maybe it does not have to be question and answer. Maybe you have questions, but let's spend a few minutes. Speak out. What do you feel now? Look around. How do you feel right now? If nobody is standing, I'll give the microphone to Mark. So in, in case you, you, you no, just... Speak. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, how are you now? <laughs> yeah. How do Put you up feel? your hand and we'll give you the microphone. Yeah. There is some, another microphone. Yes. Yeah, we have it there, yeah. over there. Please. Yeah, please. 
We have a maximum of two, two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, so that we can uh, be able to reach more voices. Okay. Um, how I feel, I'm feeling now, yeah. fulfilled is the summary. Um, I feel fulfilled because I'm here and I witnessed this event. But at the same time, I feel agitated to ask some quick issues. It's not just asking questions. I was so much um, thrilled with the idea of Nyerere and Catholic social teaching. Um, I'm from, sorry, I'm Theodore from Nigeria. Um, recently, we had elections in Nigeria, and uh, about a month ago, my alma mater, one of the seminaries I attended, asked me to write something for them. And the concept they gave me was, can a Nigerian politician be saved? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have done what I have done and sent to them. But I went through the trajectory of Catholic social teaching. So from Rerum Novarum as Pacha Minteris, Quaradjus Manu, and all of them. But one thing that struck me as you were talking is the symbiotic relationship between Nyerere and Paul VI and John Paul II. And I'm beginning to think the Catholic social touch has been, the reference works are all papal encyclicals, most often. So I just wanted to know, curiously, having heard so much about Nyerere, and I'm asking, couldn't his work be included into the text of Catholic social teaching? Is it out of place? Or must Catholic social teaching or thoughts draw their inspiration only from encyclicals and apostolic exhortations? Thank you. Thank you so much. Somebody is okay. Yeah. Over, Maybe later on you can respond. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Francisco Incerpi. I want to first thank uh, someone that invited me this morning from Tanzania. He's uh, part of the Nierberes family. If you are listening to me uh, online, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, I was um, uh, Italian and Venezuelan. I was brought up in Caracas. I went to the San Ignacio de Loyola High School in Caracas, where Father General Souza was there. I remember him by his mustache. Now they are white, but he <laughs> looks the same. Um, my question or my intrigue, which I had already communicated to this member of the family that invited me, is how is it possible that someone that is famous because of his socialist uh, background or his socialist inspiration, the Arusha Declaration, uh, article number one is all men are created equal. Uh, this is the basis of socialism. I'm a socialist. I have no problem of uh, saying, well, let's take Mualimu uh, Julius uh, Nyerere to heaven as a saint. But uh, in the Catholic Church, there are traditional current, currents or conservative which might, might not like this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, so the well, point is not to, not to bring Julius Nyerere to heaven, bring him down to the church <laughs> and to the curriculum. <laughs> Don't there. tell me that there is nothing which uh, you want to share with us. Unfortunately, with those who are online, we cannot... Uh... Okay, there is somebody over come, there. Come. Yani amuna maswali, amuna chochote cha ku hata wa Tanzania eh jameni, ongeeni. Yani baba wa taifa. I'm Dixon Kilula from Tanzania. First of all, I'm grateful for the preparation. I thank the committee who has prepared this for this good initiative. I feel honored for this presentation of our first president. As I see in the world of today, our politicians 
of what I knew about Nyerere and of what is presented very nice, very well with our presenters. I think if Nyerere, who is now a servant of God, if colonized, I would propose him to be part one of politicians. Because he's a model, a role model of, of politicians. His sacrifice has presented. I never knew that point which was underlined by one of the presenters that Nyerere took a big risk because he left his job as a teacher. He had good salary. But he left that and he entered into politics for the good of the community, his people. And that's what he did. So he lived by what he received from contribution from other members to help him while he had his job to take care of his family. So I think compared to our current politicians who are taking even what, we, what is there for the whole community, for themselves, <laughs> it should be really <clears throat> a role model of all politicians today and a, a part of the saint if colonized of all politicians. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. We Thank have you somebody very much. else. Okay, it's a sister. Is. Ah, okay. There is a, we have a sister here, please. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, let us first give the, the microphone to the sister, then you, please. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm a Tanzanian and I'm a student in Urbaniana. So I came Sorry. when I heard there was this thing, something of Nyerere. Sorry. I'm very grateful. Really, as a Tanzanian, I feel proud. And this proud, let us feel all of us, not only for Tanzanians, for this great person. And uh, I would really say one thing. What Nyerere has done, we have read many things. For us Tanzanians, from the studies we use it to hear, we would, we would read. Myself, I personally, when he died, I was already a bit with the 20 something years old. So we knew Nyerere, we saw Nyerere speaking and all those things. But today, not only for Tanzanians, let us be God fearing where we are. Even if we are religious priests, because we can also be devil fearing instead of God fearing. So let us be God fearing. And let us follow this example of Nyerere wherever we are. To, to carry this, it is a responsibility for us. For me, it is a challenge. Carry this responsibility and to share this spirit of brotherhood and the spirit of humanhood to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. So over there first and then there. First of all, yes, please. First of all, thank you very much for a very good and well-articulated um, presentation from all the presenters. And uh, I wish my question, um, I could have asked this question, was the, His Excellence was around. I don't know if the representatives are here. The question is, from what we have listened, very good about uh, Nyerele. I'm Zambian. I stayed in Tanzania for nine years. The political atmosphere in Tanzania currently, has it been, uh, is it having in Nyerele's life and his political um, concepts and worldview, are they currently influencing Tanzania? or it remains in the books, and the leadership is not taking into consideration how Nyerele lived. From the nine, nine years experience which I've had in Tanzania, I think it, they have to reflect more on what um, Julius Nyerele, the legacy had left for them. Very little they have done as regards the as regards the legacy he left. So that's the only challenge which I can pose to Tanzania. Uh, in Tanzania, there is, or oh, in uh, 
some languages they say other people or even even in the in the scripture I think the people we can all the people from other countries can praise this man and we admire him so much but the owners there they may not admiring him that much of which I understand they do, but the thing is to put in practice what uh, this man, he is a great man, what he did, if they can pick some pages and patches from his life and then put that into practice. Thank Tanzania you. should be a role model. Thank you so much. Thank you, really. Thank you. But, okay, so we are taking the two questions there and then one more. So it is one, two, and somebody over there. Oh. And, uh, no, because otherwise we are, we, we are going to stay until... Um... Okay. Yes, I feel so much grateful to be part of this colloquium this evening. My first uh, contact with this great man, Malimo Julius Yerere, was during my philosophy years back in Nigeria. I'm Leonard Elomie from Nigeria, and I'm grateful to my professor then who introduced us to this figure of uh, worthy of admiration. Just recently, I was thinking about mentoring, and I had to get some materials about mentoring because I really believe that mentoring seems to be the way forward. If we have deficit in leadership in many places, it could be as a result of the fact that those who find themselves in positions of leadership, they are not prepared, they don't have people who inspire them, and they cannot in turn inspire others. In the person of I see a reflection also of somebody I admire so much who happens to have been a governor in my own state back there in Nigeria. I didn't know about him, but I had to preach at a mass for his memorial many years later. Going through the records from what I read and from what people said about him, I was able to speak as though I knew him personally. So my question is this for the future. Beyond the influence that those he read, those he related with had on him, going back to his family, his parents, his immediate family environment, what was the impact they had on him also? Because I think the family being the, the fundamental unit of the society always has a role to play. Especially now that many, many people are in trouble because the family system is stuck at the Jew. Uh, the family system is stuck at the end of June. So I know that this is the work of the professor. I'm sure he's going to put out another book on that one. Eh? <laughs> this professor is here. So we were having a question over there, please. Okay, thank you so much. Father Bezo Chinedu, Achusim, a Nigerian. Just um, the first point, very brief and succinct. While Father Tempos, I want to thank him, shared the post, the invitation to the Nigerian group WhatsApp, the first thing that came to my mind was, could Julius, could Julius Nyerere have ever imagined while he was alive that someday his picture will be mounted in the Aula Magna in Rome, Gregorian University, and then talks from various professors all over the world, gather, and then the hall, so filled up while he was laboring, sacrificing, and dying for the good of his country. Surely, I want to believe he never imagined this. So the impact of our selfless existence. That is the, the, in ethics we call it the unforeseen logical consequences of an action. So sure, he never imagined that while he was burning himself out like a candle in Tanzania that someday look at his sure, image sure, in sure. such honor glory and dignity. Thank you so Friends, much. Thank I'm you, my just brother. inspired by this. Thank then, you. Thank the you. second point, I want to say this. We are running out of time. Yeah, so. sure. Um, I want, um, in Africa, oftentimes we, we share about the beauties of Africa, the Nile, the Niger, and all whatnot. But 
As Ratzinger said, when he was asked about the beauty of the church, he said the saints. And he stands out as one of the beauties of our We are Africa. concluding. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, really. Thank you so much. I will give uh, Father uh, we, the microphone, please. Please. We are closing the questions. Uh, the, 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 sorry, but uh, who knows? Maybe we'll have another chance. Let me give time to Father Alejo before we say the last, last words. No, maybe one minute each uh, of the three speakers. Last word, one minute. Parting short. To, to respond to the questions. Not really, just last word. Yeah. Uh, just, just thank you all so much. It's, uh, it's been really such a pleasure to be here and to just um, learn from each other and everyone else. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, this gathering has uh, uh, created a lot of interest in uh, trying to understand the Mwalimu and his contribution to humanity. So <clears throat> let us keep on learning from him and pushing the agenda for humanity. Thank you very much. I think the last speaker said that Nyerere would not have imagined that we would be here today talking about him with a big picture <laughs> in front of here. But I think we need to move further than this audience, I remember an experience some years back, a student at Heathrow College in London wanted to write his dissertation on Nyerere, and he couldn't because the university could not supervise him or even provide the resources for his kind of research. I really think that this is probably <coughs> time. Universities like this great place should consider what do we have in our library about Nyerere? Thank you. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. So we're coming to an end. Um, thank you very much for the administrators, the guests, the guests of honor, and then especially our speakers. Thank you very much. But I'd like to mention also a few partners, the Fondazione Fratelli Tutti, who supported us uh, in, in some uh, finances. Also, um, the Jesuit Justice and Ecology Network, based in uh, Nairobi, under Father Chilufia. The students of Licentiate Program in Leadership and Management, out of their own pockets, they, they gathered 120 euros just to, you know, voluntarily uh, donate for this event. Of course, our uh, um, uh, embassy, the Tanzanian embassy is a big partner and it promises to work further in our next projects. There have been many volunteers, Anj and um, uh, where's the? Maureen Temple and uh, Maria, Father Paul Tang, Father Serge Boroto, who produced the video. And I'd like to mention Father Gabriel Massey, who tagged me along for one month around uh, Tanzania, and he introduced to me the figure of Julius Nyerere, as well as Father Magessa. So all of you are promoters by being, by being here. So we all say, Molimu Julius Nyerere, Utombe. Molimu Julius Nyerere, pray for us. Again, Molim. Molimo Julius Nyerere Utombe. Pray for us. Thank you very much. Asante San. Just before we finish, Kule Tanzania wanasema wesu kacha mgeni akaenda ivo. Sivo. So I would like to request Father to come forward to help us give our guest or gift our guest. Okay. Rosine, where are you? Can somebody look for Rosine wherever she is? Oh, okay, she's here. Please. Just something to remember that one day when you were talking about, you spoke about the, the great man, Mwalimu Julius Kambarange Nyerere, uh, the Gregorian University. So thank you so, so much to our three speakers. Thank you to everybody. And as we conclude this significant forum dedicated to Mwalimu Julius Nyerere's legacy, 
Heartfelt thanks to each participant for your active engagement and valuable contributions. Special gratitude to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Father Leho for enriching our discussions also and bringing Mwali Munyerere here to the Gregorian University. Thank you to all of us and let us take the life and the legacy of Mwali Julius Nyerere wherever we are, okay? Thank you so much. Asanteni and see you next. <laughs>